So I want to um, welcome everyone to our program tonight. Our speaker is um, Dr. Todd Bragey, right? Okay. And he's a professor of anthropological archaeology at UCSD, and his specialty is in long-term human environmental um, connections, basically, uh, the archaeology of marine um, societies and, um, and ways to understand them and also how to apply some of those things to like modern fisheries and some, some things like that as well. Uh, he conducts most of his work in California, but uh, <clears throat> he has other work in um, uh, Baja Mexico and also the Solomon Islands. He's also the author of a new book, which is, which is titled um, exactly the same as, as our program tonight. And that's my phone telling me that I have to get busy because I have a Zoom meeting started. <laughs> so that's, that's what that is. Okay, so Todd, I, I wanna thank you for coming and uh, I'll turn this over to you. You want me to share your screen here? Okay. I think we'll go with this one and see if this one's gonna work. Okay, a second here. I'm doing this part because often we have this little glitch right here. We always do from the beginning. It's not working, so oh, no, what the heck here? I'll go to this one. Okay. There we go. Okay. Okay. So you just push these bottoms at the end and that will advance. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you all for being here. I, I only imagine all your brackets are busted, and that's why you're here not watching the NC, no NCAA fans. Um, thanks for being here. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk today uh, about uh, our, our new a, a new book I have with a couple of my closest uh, colleagues, Islands Through Time, and sort of take you through the human and ecological history of the place that I've worked for the last 15 years. A uh, place that, you know, my co-authors have worked for upwards of 30, 40 years and sort of our, our treatise on the, the history of the islands and what we can learn from this history. So California has this incredibly rich uh, Native American uh, cultural history throughout the state. Primarily, this was a history of hunter-gatherers that were adapted in these unique ways to this unique ecology of, of California. And understanding this history has been my passion as an archeologist. And it's not just to understand the history and certainly that, that, that's a good reason to, to, to uncover what the past in Calif the pre-Columbian California past was like, but I, I really do believe that there are lessons to be learned from this history that we can apply today and into the future. Um, in our conservation efforts. So I'll, I'll sort of take you through this history of the, of the Northern Channel Islands, and at the end kind of tell you what I think this all means or why it's, I see it as applicable as we move forward in, in a rapidly changing world. So these are the Northern Channel Islands, uh, San Miguel, Santa Rosa, Santa Cruz, and Anacapa. Um, and uh, again, the place that I've worked for over 15, uh, 15 years. Um, and these were these islands were occupied and the adjacent mainland were occupied uh, prehistorically by the Shumash Indians and uh, they accomplished uh, something that very few hunter gatherers did, and that was at European contact that first Spanish contact, they were living in densely occupied coastal island villages and were subsisting in these complex hierarchical societies without agriculture. So they were hunter gatherers all the way up to, to Spanish contact um, and achieved these really dense population densities uh, despite not having agriculture. Only a few places in the world do we see this uh, prehistorically and, and Southern California was one of them. And uh, this is due at least on the mainland uh, because of this rich ecological diversity. So if you go to uh, the Southern California mainland the Santa Barbara Channel area, you have kind of these stacked ecosystems where the mountains sit right up next to the sea and you have these different 
ecological zones that, that people were subsisting on in a variety of terrestrial resources uh, in a really circumscribed area combined with a really rich uh, marine ecosystem of sea mammals, really dense shellfish and, and kelp forests, nearshore fish, sea mammals like otters and cetaceans like dolphins and whales. And on the islands in particular, this rich, diverse community of different uh, sea mammals, uh, uh, six different seals and sea lion species that populate the beach. So just a really rich environment for, for uh, people to occupy and um, uh, create their subsistence economies. Now, in terms of the islands, uh, there was very little compared to the mainland in, in terms of terrestrial resources. We often call the, the islands uh, relatively more depopulated or, or less resource rich. Um, the largest uh, land mammal on the islands was uh, the very cute pygmy mammoth. Uh, uh, Full-size Colombian mammoth swam out prior to human arrival. Uh, they went through a process of dwarfism, getting really cute and really small, about six feet tall. There were also Col uh, Colombian mammoths out there as well as they swam across the channel uh, sometime in the quaternary. Um, other than, than these mammoths, uh, the largest uh, land mammal was the island fox that we'll get to in a second. Uh, the islands look very different uh, when humans first arrived. There are the Northern Channel Islands today. This is what they look like about 16,000 years and, uh, and uh, up to the current time. So these different, different colored parts show you the, the um, the geography of the islands uh, 16,000 years ago to, to the current. So uh, 16,000 years ago, they were all attached into one super island we call Santa Rosé. You could walk from Anacapa all the way past San Miguel. Uh, and rising sea levels since the last glacial has uh, drowned about 75% uh, of the islands uh, today, right? So. The, when people first arrived, the earliest site we have on the islands is this one. This is Arlington Spring site, a very famous archaeological site, uh, Santa Rosa Island, where Phil Orr, who was the um, curator of the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History in 1959, found human remains that had been dated to 13,000 years ago. Right, so once one of the oldest sets of human remains in all of North America, really incredible. So other than, than those human remains, we didn't until recently know much about these first peoples on the Channel Islands. Uh, all we had were these sets of human remains. And the next set of sites we had came from two cave sites on San Miguel, uh, Daisy Cave, and then right around the corner from Daisy Cave is Cave of the Chimneys. Uh, if you look at Cave of the Chimneys, you go around the point the other side, uh, Daisy Cave is over there. These are two deeply stratified cave deposits that go back to 11,500 years ago, and they give us a better insight. Where they, they, um, uh, they don't have these early human remains like Arlington, but they have technology and subsistence remains that tells us more about what some of these earliest islanders were doing. So they were creating these uh, unique technologies that we also see on the mainland a bit of it, that they're called crescent technologies that are probably hafted onto a shaft and used for uh, seabird hunting. Uh, those are uh, on the upper right, your left, are uh, probably sandal fragments. And then a variety of beads. Uh, below those beads are probably the trimmings of, of seagrass netting, uh, maintenance of nets. And then some of the earliest fish hooks in all of North America, these by bone by points that were a uh, fishing line was attached, uh, kelp forest or near for shore fish would swallow those and they give them a tug, they get, they get caught and we'd be able to reel those in, right? So this set of very clearly uh, uh, maritime hunting, gathering and fishing technology that was the earliest adaptation to these Channel Islanders. And then deeply buried in uh, Daisy Cave was one of these points, 
a really small, what we call stemmed and barbed point that we always thought was intrusive. So there, there's a lot of problems with the caves. Uh, they were, they'd been looted at times and, and um, earlier archeologists had kind of mixed the, the materials a bit. And we, so we thought this was intrusive. We thought it was fairly young. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've done a bunch of surveys around the island looking for other early sites. We knew about some of these stemmed points. We always assumed they were less than 2000 years old. It turns out all these stemmed point technologies, what we call Channel Island barbed points or amole points, another variety of them, are older than 8000 years. And we've used this technology then to survey the islands, understanding this is a very old diagnostic technology. And we found site after site of these earliest islanders with Channel Island bar points, those crescents that you saw before, other sort of stone tool technology, and a variety of faunal remains, things like um, hundreds of, of goose bones and seabird and fish and marine mammals. Again, a very much maritime hunting and fishing technology of these earliest islanders. As it stands, we have something now like 100 archeological sites that are over 8,000 years on the Channel Islands. So, and remember, 75% of the islands are now underwater. So we're only seeing the tip of the proverbial iceberg, right? So uh, when, when I started my career on the islands, we thought there were very few people on the islands 10,000 years ago. I would say in the last five or 10 years, everything has been turned on its ear. And we think that the islands were occupied by a fair amount of people very early in time. Again, because we're not even seeing that underwater, uh, that underwater now submerged landscape. So this is, has caused us to rethink and, and many folks to rethink uh, a lot about what we know about the arrival of the first humans in North America. So many of you probably learned as I did when I was uh, in college and in, in uh, high school that the first Americans walked across the Bering Land Bridge during uh, the Ice Age. They walked down an ice-free corridor and they ended up in the heartland of North America. And they were hunting mammoths and mastodons with big Clovis points, these fluted point technology. Well, because of the, our work on the Channel Islands, because of a number of other sites that have been found around North America and South America, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. The earliest archeological record in North and South America seems to predate the opening of this ice-free corridor. And it may now make much more sense. We're in a, a time where we're trying to figure this out, but it seems like it makes a lot more sense that people may have been in boats uh, following the Pacific Coast shorelines and moving down the West Coast of North and South America as the first arrival route into the new world. People probably did walk, but it probably happened later. And stemmed points, those Channel Island barb points, may be one uh, marker in helping us trace this early coastal migration into the new world. So the jury's still out on that. We're still doing a lot of work to try to figure this out. Uh, but my colleague and co-author, John Erlinson, has called this the kelp forest highway that might have helped people um, move into the new world following these kelp forest resources. Yes? Are these the similar points? I forget already what you call them. Yeah. Further up uh, along the coast of North America? There are similar uh, stemmed point technology. So there's this stemmed point that comes, stemmed points that come from Paisley Cave. We find these in the Great Basin. There are very similar kind of stemmed point technologies that come from uh, Japan that date to about 16,000 years ago. So it's not a smoking gun, uh, but we're, we're trying to work on, well, what's the level of similarity? What does this mean? Is this uh, uh, sharing of information? Is this people migrating? Is it just happenstance that we get similar kinds of technologies across the Pacific right about the same time? Jury's still out, but I, I do find this really interesting. And there's, um, I, I think we're going to know a lot more in the next 10, 20 years on this topic. 
So this has been, I mean, in terms of the Channel Islands, this has been one of the really hot research topics. When did, how did people first arrive on the islands and into North America and this colonization 13,000 or more years ago? And then the other hot area of, of research on the Channel Islands has been the rise of sociopolitical complexity. How do you get hunter gatherers with chiefly level societies living in densely packed coastal villages? What happened? Well, and what hasn't been studied a lot is what's been called the muddle in the middle, right? And this is, well, how did we go from that colonization of probably fairly small groups of hunter-gatherers, we think there are more out on the islands than we ever did before, to these complex, densely populated villages. So what happened in that intervening time? Well, the Channel Islands is a great place to sort of to, to work this out. So this is my favorite spot on all the Channel Islands. It's on Northwestern San Miguel Island. This is a 300 foot high dune called Otter Point. And each of those dark layers that I have labeled in there is a shell midden or an archeological site, a trash pit of people living in this area. And we have a sequence in just this one spot going back 7,000 years. So we can trace a history of people living in this spot for 7,000 years, and there are bunches of spots. There are a number of really good spots just like this all over the Channel Islands. Just to give you some scale, there are two people standing on the top of that dune, right? So just really incredible archaeology. And then we don't have some of the problems we have on the mainland. No Walmarts, no strip malls, no development to, to mess up these sites. And best of all, no horrible burrowing gophers that, that move our sites around and mess up our stratigraphy, the much hated by archeologists. We don't have to deal with any of that because these records are really well preserved and protected by Channel Islands National Park. So we can go to sites like this, just to give you an idea of like, these places that we get to work. This is a three meter deep shoe mass shell midden, which is essentially means just a trash pit. Uh, on Western San Miguel that tells us about life on the island for over, for nearly 3,000 years. And you can kind of see this dense um, uh, midden that's mostly refuse of people living on these coastal resources, but also their tools uh, and, and waste debris and leftover beads and anything else they happen to lose or throw away. And so this muddle in the middle is actually a really interesting uh, a time period. So people have kind of been obsessed with, with each end or really focused on each end, but the middle is really important. What we call the middle Holocene, what's been called the middle in the middle. And what happens during this time uh, are, are a number of things. People start to expand their subsistence economies. So they go after estuarine resources. There are one known estuary, um, Estuarine ecosystem that was on eastern, sorry, I got to get my, my bearings, eastern Santa Rosa Island, and people were going after estuarine shellfish. A phenomenon called red abalone middens shows up during this time period where you get these really large red abalones that show up densely packed in archaeological sites. This is a, a, a new adaptation, and people start going more intensively off of terrestrial resources, what uh, blue dicks or geophytes, they're just this, you know, this bulb that people are digging and perhaps maintaining landscapes to help create good habitat for blue dicks for, for these geophytes. So uh, what this tells us, why this is important, because with this uh, red abalone midden phenomenon, you start getting people going after these subtitle red abalone, they can tell us about specialized technology like uh, uh, creating abalone pry bars to, to remove these from rocks, probably get uh, more intensively using boats for offshore harvest, perhaps diving in the subtidal region, red abalones like colder, deeper waters, people started to, to dive for them. So as populations start to increase, what seems to be happening is people start to expand their subsistence economy to meet the demands of these growing populations. And then the entire subsistence economy starts to shift. I know this is blocked a little bit, uh, but essentially what this shows you is a shift from 
primarily harvesting easy to access intertidal shellfish very early in that in, with those first islanders to doing less of that and going after things that are harder to get like fish and sea mammals. You need more technology. You need more time. It's riskier. Not everyone can do it. Certainly, I, you wouldn't put me out there fishing. I'd never get anything, right? So you have to have specialized knowledge. Whereas intertidal shellfish, anyone at low tide can walk out and gather these things and a, a, with relatively little technology, little processing and little risk. So as these populations go up, these subsistence economies start to expand. With that, we see the introduction of new uh, technologies to make that happen. Things like mortars and pestles to process these terrestrial resources, probably like uh, geophytes, blue dicks. Uh, new fishing technologies, right? So I showed you those bone bipoints. We get more elaborate circular shell fish hooks made out of mussel and abalone. Uh, that first appear about 3,400 years ago. Again, as these, in, uh, these economies are intensifying, people start to shift on, on uh, the resources they're using. So we also see the antecedents to complexity. So uh, Chester King, who, who's worked for a very long time in the Santa Barbara Channel region, uh, analyzed these assemblages dating between about 6,000 and 3,000 years ago and starts to see differences in grave goods. Some people are uh, buried with lots of cool stuff like beads and ornaments and technologies, other people with very little or nothing at all. So this tells us about wealth disparity. We start to see the haves and the have nots and the antecedents to complexity and hierarchies and wealth differences between people. We also during this time see the Shumash sort of changing the ecology of the entire islands themselves. So based on genetic work that Tori Rick and some of his um, uh, collaborators have done, we, uh, it looks like that people brought mainland gray foxes out to the islands about 9,000 years ago intentionally, and they became the island foxes that we know today. We underwent that process of dwarfism, and that was probably an, uh, an intentional introduction of mainland grays about 9,000 years ago. Uh, we also know that people probably introduced accidentally um, mainland deer mouse, uh, deer mice to the islands. People were going back and forth in boats uh, as trade ramped up that, that uh, with the mainland to the islands, uh, trade relationships ramped up and people started accidentally dropping off uh, island or mainland mice that then outcompeted the giant island my, mice. Uh, and those went extinct, the giant, giant island deer mouse variety went extinct and was replaced by mainland deer mice. Uh, so again, this uh, messing unintentionally with these ecosystems. Humans, when humans arrive about 13,000 years ago, that's the oldest site we have. We may have another one that's a little older. We haven't announced that yet, but um, uh, mammoths go extinct on the islands right about the same time. There's never been a clear indication that humans were involved in that extinction, uh, but they co-occur. But we know humans were involved in the extinction of Chendiades, which is a flightless scoter that, but this was a, pro, a protracted extinction that people started to hunt these animals uh, starting at least nine to 10,000 years ago, and they go extinct about 2,400 years ago. That may be human hunting, but also the introduction of these new predators like foxes to the islands may have helped accelerate that. Why do you say it introduced the fox? That's a great question. I'll get down, I'll get back to that at the end. That's a great question, but I'll I'll get off on a tangent and I'm running a little a little late. Okay, so um, that all is the 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 muddle in the middle. Um, and uh, that leads us to this moment. And about 1,500 years ago, we get permanently occupied, large, consolidated villages. Can you see those house pits in that picture in the upper left? We get new boating technologies, the plank canoe made out of redwood planks um, sewn together uh, called tamals. 
We get new phishing technology, uh, an increased reliance on, on phishing as the staple of the economy and a money system. So we have dollar bills. Uh, they had uh, money beads. A bead was made from a certain shell in a certain way, and that was the Benjamin, right? And you, um, you could buy goods and services with those shell beads. This was prehistoric money. And that all ramped up as these populations started to explode, complexity started to explode, and wealth disparities, hierarchies really ramped up on the Channel Islands. So just to give you an idea of the subsistence change, fish becomes the main staple, right? What do you need for fish? You need boats, line, fish hooks. It's intensive. It's hard work. It's a lot of labor, but when you have populations growing in these big villages, you need to expand your economy. And it, so it was expanded to the fishing. Trade with the mainland and other groups became very important with the Southern Islands, with the mainland, with interior groups. This was all facilitated by the plank canoe, the tamal. Only certain people knew how to build the tamal. It was a it was this secret society called the Brotherhood of the Tamal that uh, owned the knowledge on how to build these canoes. And if you were wealthy enough, you can commission one and then use it as your vehicle to, to, um, uh, to, to build wealth. And then these money beads. So olivella shells, a certain part, you can only make one bead out of that olivella, one money bead out of that olivella shell. And they were strung up into these uh, necklaces or strings and then used to pay for goods and services. So with all this happening, at this time, what was also happening is that you had an increase in violence, interpersonal violence. Things were going bad. Uh, people were, uh, we have higher incidences of, of people uh, it buried with, with projectile points as lethal uh, injuries with peri fractures, sort of defensive fractures as people were, were getting hit, of interpersonal conflict, right? So uh, there, there seems as all this is happening, uh, there is, um, uh, there's all this social political turmoil on the Channel Islands as well. That ameliorates at about 650 years ago. And so linked with that, what seems to be at least partially driving a lot of this is climate change. Uh, oceans were cooler, they were colder, uh, ocean temperatures, they were more productive, but things were drier, there was less rainfall. And so what we think was happening is people were coalescing in these big villages next to fresh water. There were uh, more and more people to fill, to feed. And then because of that, there was all this conflict. There were issues between villages um, as people are ramping up these economies. All that is going on. Chiefly leaders start to, to, to sort of lead these villages. And then it sort of works itself out. Now it takes 600 years to work itself out. Uh, but this, it, it seems to ameliorate um, after that in, in what we call the late period. Right. So again, so we see island populations, sort of, of villages ramping up again in this time of conflict, uncertainty, and and drought um, that then ameliorates um, right before uh, European contact. Um, and again, chiefly leaders, socio-political complexity was probably helped work some of this out, right? To uh, or socio-political complexity, this the cementing of socio-political chiefly leadership across these villages uh, was a reaction to all these sort of stressors on Shumash society. So again, well, this all uh, fundamentally changed in 1542 when Cabrillo and Spanish explorers landed and wintered on, on uh, the islands for six weeks. This ushered in a, a much different and uh, a new time for the Shumash that was um, no doubt disruptive and without doubt um, devastating for Shumash lifeways. Uh, we see general population increases through time. Once we get that first Spanish contact, that first European contact, 
We see population declines that are rapid. Uh, the introduction of old world diseases uh, hit the Chumash hard like they did uh, all indigenous populations through the Americas. Um, and, uh, you know, in California, we often celebrate this time, right? This California mission period is this uh, time of sharing and understanding between indigenous populations and uh, the Spanish. Uh, it's been called the Ramona myth. And in reality, uh, it was a devastating time for, for uh, the Chumash people, for indigenous peoples across California. The Chumash, like many, were um, coerced into uh, uh, forced labor to build the infrastructure of the Spanish empire. And uh, populations crash, indigenous lifeways were fundamentally disrupted, in, in, including subsistence economies and traditional cultures and uh, connections between island and mainland um, and interland uh, Chumash. And uh, in, in many cases, the Chumash didn't have much choice, right? Uh, they entered into this system because their land that they needed for hunting and gathering in the subsistence economy that they developed over 10,000 years was being occupied by cattle, right? And uh, the other infrastructure of the agrarian system introduced by the Spanish. So that there, uh, in many cases, they, they weren't given much of a choice. But fortunately, uh, there are thousands of, of Chumash descendants today. There's been a revival in their cultural traditions uh, that are celebrated here and in, in Santa Barbara and elsewhere. And so uh, they've weathered this storm and, and continue uh, their languages, their cultures and, and, and revitalization movement. So why do all this? Why learn this? Well, let me take you through a few things that we can learn uh, from understanding this history. Well, we can understand if we're gonna have a national park on the Northern Channel Islands, uh, we have to understand how that ecosystem got to what it is today and how we're gonna manage it in the future. And what we know now is that dogs were introduced by the Chumash about seven, 8,000 years ago. Foxes were introduced about 9,000 years ago. Deer mice were introduced about 11,000 years ago. And we now think skunks may have been intentionally introduced. The Santa, I'll, I'll get to that. I know it's confusing. Like, why would you introduce the skunk? Uh, intentionally introduced. Um, and so we can't just assume everything out on the islands that we see today is natural if our definition of natural is pre-human. Right. And so the Chumash have been managing and interacting with these uh, landscapes for thousands of years. And we need to understand that history. And so when I think about the islands before the Chumash got there, this might be what the islands look like. There were no big mammals out there. They would have been a bird sanctuary. Right. So there have been all these changes that we need to consider when we think about management of the islands today. Those red abalone mittens that I mentioned and kind of like moved past fairly quickly. Well, what we know about those is that you can't have abundant red abalone fisheries like we were seeing 8,000 to about 3,000 years ago with healthy, abundant sea otter populations. We think the Chumash were intentionally reducing otter populations or at least scaring them out of watersheds to make red abalone fisheries more productive. And so they were managing not only the landscapes, but the seascapes as well. Perhaps a lesson we can learn. Today in, in, uh, in our commercial fisheries, when we go to sushi, and I, I do this too, I order the tuna, right? I order swordfish. I order the, the high trophic level fish. That's what we all love to eat, right? That we know is an unsustainable way to harvest the oceans. You take out all the big high trophic level fish first, creatures first, it caused cascading effects of decline down the ecosystem. It's called fishing down the food web. The Chumash worked the opposite way. They fished up the food web. 
low trophic level first. And as they needed more to feed a growing population, they added higher and higher trophic level fish and creatures into their diet, right? So they fished up the food web. Perhaps we can learn something about that too. And we see that with, as the technology sort of uh, changed, uh, so did subsistence practices. Give you one more example. I think this is my last one. Um, the archeological sites that we see out on the islands with sea mammal bones, they tend to be filled with Guadalupe fur seals. And there are very few elephant seals from archeological sites. Today, you go out to the islands, those islands are filled, the island beaches are filled with elephant seals. You, are, you would be exceptionally lucky if you ever saw a Guadalupe fur seal. There has probably been a demographic reversal since overhunting of these animals happened in the historic period with the uh, blubber and fur trade, right? That caused the populations that near extinction levels and they have not recovered in a way that's natural, in a way that we've seen them probably occupy the Channel Islands for 10,000 years. So I would argue our management of these animals isn't done. Something has fundamentally changed and we need to figure that out. We also know in, in terms of the terrestrial landscape, the shoe masks starting about 7,000 years ago were setting fire to island landscapes intentionally to create fields for geophytes, for these blue dicks. So if we're gonna manage the terrestrial environment today and take out all the invasive species and put back uh, the native species, we can't just assume the scrubland environment that the islands seem to go back towards naturally is what was the environment for 10,000 years. And in fact, we know that the Chumash were burning and managing these environments on the islands just like they were on the mainland just like much of California was happening to much in California of the mainland. So we need to at least consider this in terms of our management and what we want these islands to look like. So with the historic period, when the Chumash were removed from the islands uh, in about the 1820s, the islands were transformed to these cattle ranching and fishing and hunting sea mammal and otter hunting outposts the island land and seascapes fundamentally changed uh, and fundamentally changed so quickly that it wasn't documented. We don't know, uh, we don't have records documenting those changes from the uh, uh, pre-contact to today. And so it's archeological records, it's uh, paleological records, it's geological records that can help us understand what these islands and these places look like through deep time. So we need to really think deeply about what, for example, plants are truly natural to the islands. How have they changed? And it's the archeological record and other deep historical records that can tell us a lot about that. So I have a really long slide here with all the things that you should have learned. <laughs> Because I'm a, you know, I teach at a university, so I put this up. But a great archaeological record. I, I won't read all this to you. Um, but again, I just want to sort of hammer home that uh, when we think about restoration and conservation and uh, what we want our world to look like, there is great utility in first looking backwards and understanding how these ecosystems have evolved through deep time with and without humans, and then what path we wanna put, chart those ecosystems, those seascapes in into the future. That's all for me, thanks so much. Yeah. Well, if you could repeat them so both sides know what they are. Sure, should I go to the Fox one? Yeah. 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 So I'll, I'll, the, the Fox one. Yeah. Uh, we don't, I, I'll say we don't really know. Right. But um, we've done some, uh, there's been some genetic work on foxes, both past and present, um, you know, ancient foxes and modern foxes. And at first we thought, well, they're there like dogs kind of cleaning up camp, right? You throw your scraps and they'll eat those. What we found surprisingly that foxes weren't eating a marine diet. 
So that's not what they were doing. Uh, but one thing that we think, well, we know foxes were important in, in Southern California on the Southern Channel Islands, you have fox burials, uh, double fox burials, and they were sort of important in, as part of the ritual complex of the Gabrielino. They were, they, they served an important uh, mythological ritual story for the Shumash as well, but more practically, they could have been used for pelts. They could have been used for meat. We do find fox bones in middens, so in trash sites. So they were probably eating them in times of scarcity. So when you don't have any terrestrial meat packages, bringing foxes out is a pretty good idea, right? Because you can eat a fox in a time of need. And if you've ever been on San Miguel or the Channel Islands, when it's, I don't know, April and it's blowing 40 knots, you would really want your otter or fox coat to keep you warm. And so it may have been a, a technological purpose as well. Um, skunks, I, I mentioned skunks. We're, we're, we're still looking into skunks and, and whether they were brought out. Um, and there's uh, someone in Oklahoma, Courtney Hoffman is doing some genetics on ancient skunks to try to sort some of this out. Uh, but it could have been much the same reason, uh, pelts, uh, food in time of scarcity. And we know that um, skunks for like, there's examples of Plains Indians having sort of semi-domesticated, not domesticated, but sort of skunk pets that hang around um, uh, camps and as they're moving around and they actually make fairly good, not pets, but I don't know, multi-species collaborators in some way. So uh, we don't know really for sure, but it was probably a technological, I mean, there's probably some good technological and subsistence reasons mm -hmm. to have them, especially on the Pauperate Islands. Is Island of the Blue Dolphins a total myth? Not at all. So it's based on, that's from the Southern Islands. Uh, oh, one, yeah, yeah, so it's it's based on a uh, 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 Gabrielino woman that was left on the islands or intentionally stayed because the, as the story goes her that her child was left behind and she was rescued by night of her uh, and died shortly after being brought to the mainland so it is based in in uh in in historical fact yeah well the red abalone gets pretty much wiped out because uh, the large ones we see decline in size through time, but they are never wiped out, right? So even after all the way up to historic contact, they're making red abalone beads and fish hooks, but they're smaller red abs. So they were probably intensively harvested, but never devastated and never, never brought to extirpation or extinction. Oh, uh, yeah, questions are, are coming in. Let me see. Oh boy. Um, all right. So Doug Fisk asks, how do you date the sites and artifacts? Generally use radiocarbon dating. So we could radiocarbon date uh, a shell is 10, is what we do from a, a, a shell midden. And what radiocarbon dating does, just to give you the like radiocarbon dating 101, uh, it essentially tells you the date of when that animal died. And so if you're dating a mussel shell that people pluck that mussel to eat it, it's a pretty good co-occurrence between when people uh, plucked it to eat it and, and, and the event you want to know about. And so when you have shell fish hooks, beads made out of shell, all these things are very easy to date and now very inexpensive. Uh, when did indigenous people stop living on the Channel Islands? Uh, they, they were the last of the, the island Shumash were removed in about 1822, but the 1820s. And that was uh, the sort of uh, the mission period of, of, of Southern California. Um, why introduce the foxes in the islands? Got that one. How large are these villages population? Well, uh, based on baptismal records, uh, the uh, village or the, the island population at European contact is argued to be about 3,000 people living on those islands, which is an incredibly large population. I think that's the minimum because 
you've got to understand that that um, not everyone made it to the missions to be baptized. There was devastating diseases. There were people that were were opting out of that route that were were circumventing those those systems that were in place. So we need to kind of view that I think as the minimum number. But I, I you know I would say three thousand to five thousand people on the I, just the islands is is a pretty good estimate. Villages like a good sized villages you know could be up to a hundred people. The mainland villages are, 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 are a little larger, um, a few hundred people. How large, okay, let me see my scrolling is, uh, which island is the Cabrillo Monument? That's on, on San Miguel Island. So if you take island packers out, you could take a tourist a junket out there. You walk to the top of the island, up the, the trail that everybody walks on, you'll see Cabrillo's monument up on top. Um, will camping, uh, will we be camping out? Oh, camping on uh, Santa Rosa next week? See a mid and all right, nice. Yes, lots of them on Rosa. Uh, and, and again, there's lots of uh, great um, uh, camping and, and exploration. And you could buy islands through time while you're and read it while you're headed out there. Um, let me see. Um, you you might be able. I don't know if the blue dicks are 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 blooming right now, but you might very well. I think uh, you might very well see uh, some blue dicks. Uh, so ask one of the the rangers. Uh, repeat the questions from the floor. Sorry. All right. I think that's it. I think I got it. Yes. Are the blue dicks okay. The, uh, what are the blue dicks? The blue dicks are, um, it's a plant, right? It's that geophyte, but they, they make this really beautiful kind of pink flower, purple flower thing. And you dig them up and they're, they're a bulb and that's what they're eating. It's, it's kind of like an Indian potato, right? Um, that they're really starchy. They're really uh, caloric and in actually in disturbed soils, they do really well. So around activity areas where people are like hanging around villages and you know dogs are around and foxes or whatever, right? And you're disturbing the soil, soils that are burned, they do really well. And so they were probably, I, I think about the villages on the islands are probably the seas of, of blue dicks. And the more disturbed, the better they do. They just like properly, yeah, yes. So to the mainland, there was some uh, talk of putting a mission uh, on the islands, uh, but that never happened. And so they were removed to mainland towns and missions. Um, no particular place? Uh, the, yeah, just mostly in Santa Barbara, but along that Santa Barbara coast, many, many of them went. But that, that you know, um, not everyone went into the towns and missions, uh, but basically to the mainland, sort of integrated into the Spanish economy. Did that work well for Chumash then? Uh, so, uh, you know, traditions continue. They, they, there's a lot of really interesting studies on how uh, Chumash peoples were still creating technologies out of like glass and integrating some of these European technologies and creating new beads and, and trying to maintain connections, uh, but no, things went, went uh, were devastating in terms of populations, in terms of language, in terms of cultural traditions, in terms of traditional economies. Yeah, it was a, it was a really devastating time uh, for the Chumash and Chumash culture. Yes. Is, is it impossible to survey underwater areas for uh, sites? Yeah, I, go, I give a whole nother talk about that. We've actually had a five-year project to do that. And uh, our first step has been just mapping these paleo landscapes and trying to understand the paleo geography that's now underwater. And the ultimate goal is to find archeological sites. So we've done a lot of the sonar mapping and, and key areas. Um, and then we've done some offshore coring. Um, and the good news is we, we have found paleosols like landforms that are very old and intact and there, right? 
And then, but we have yet to find a shell midden in one of those paleo salts, which is like the needle in the haystack. But I, the first kind of step, I mean, we know more about the surface of the moon now than we know about the, the ocean floor. And so it's kind of mapping these landscapes, understanding them and kind of predicting where would have people settled when they first arrived to Santa Rosa and let's go put our six inch core there or, you know, our, our vibra core, our box core, which is, you know, taking a core sample on a football field and hoping to hit like a coin, right? You know, it's just, it, it's really difficult, but we have taken the first steps to try to do that. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, are, are the islands a state park? For the most part, the Northern Islands are all a state park or they're all a national park, Channel Islands National Park. Half of Santa Cruz is uh, owned and operated by the Nature Conservancy, but they're all protected. Um, the Navy technically owns uh, Miguel, San Miguel, but Channel Islands National Park uh, uh, manages it. Um, and so you can go visit, there's regular trips out there. It's really spectacular. And then, um, and, and they are, uh, they are a, a, a sort of time capsule of Southern California. They're really special places. Yes. When's the best time to do it? Uh, I would say in the spring because there, um, you get more blooming flowers like the Coreopsis. And so if you could go in February, March, April, you can get these, the, the Coreopsis are blooming. Off. If you get some rain, the coreops are, are blooming in these just unbelievable yellow flowers. And it's like really spectacular. But honestly, anytime you go, the parks are thriving right now. And um, it, it's a great time. Like if you get up early enough and go for a hike, you're probably gonna see an island fox run across your path. I mean, it's, it's a really special place. So, okay, yes. So the in getting the um, container tankers to change their roots to protect the migrating whales going north or south between the islands and the mainland? Yeah, I, so the question is, uh, are the, the tankers uh, still interfering with migrating whales? I know there's been a lot of work to try to, to reroute them. I don't know exactly where that's at right now. Um, that's with uh, the, marine, the Channel Islands Marine Sanctuary has been really involved in that. So I, I, I don't know. Uh, for sure. But yeah, they are uh, working on that. And, you know, the islands, just like for whales and migrating whales, if you go the right time of the year, you might see some of those, but you, you go and you do the right hikes, you can um, go see, you know, elephant seals just lounging on the beaches. And I mean, it's, it's pretty spectacular if you've never, like now I go and I'm like, oh yeah, another thing of barking elephant seals. And it's kind of, you know, I'm kind of, uh, you, you get numb to it, but I mean, if you've never done it before, it, it really blows you away. Is this one island to camp on? No, you can camp on, uh, you can camp on uh, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, San Miguel. I don't know if Anacap, I wouldn't camp on Anacapa if you could, you just get dive bombed by seagulls the whole time. <laughs> um, so I don't think there's, there is, wait, there is camping on Anacapa too, but if you're going to go and make the trip, I would say Santa Cruz or Santa Rosa are very easy logistically. You got to schedule your, your uh, campsite. You got to reserve it. Um, but those two really give you the flavor. Anacap is cool to go if you just are going to go for a day hike because it's a quick boat ride over there. You hike around, you see the sites, you take the pictures, and then you're back on the mainland for fish tacos. So, um, Where do you catch the boat? Uh, you could catch it at the, uh, the Marina in Ventura. Uh, you just look up Island Packers in Ventura, California. It's right in Channel Islands Harbor. Super easy. All right. Okay. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. I, I, I want to thank you for coming out here yeah. and, and doing this for our group. It was yeah. very informative and and also very enthusiastically Thank presented. You. And that was yeah. that was great. Great. Excellent. Thank yeah. you very Thank much. You. Okay. I have books if anyone wants a book.